Anybody have an amazing Christmas? Yeah. Praise God. Praise God. Yeah, Christmas, Christmas was, 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 was really good. Not just because of the gifts under the tree, but because of the gift that hung on the tree. Amen. So our, our family, was, it, was, it, was, it was slightly, it's slightly a, a unique year. Um, Carmen's sister, my sister-in-law, and, and my brother uh, Gio, on Christmas, they actually brought home a baby. Help me, help me praise, help me praise God for that. And so, you know, you, you know, imagine on Christmas Day, you get to bring your baby home. Imagine going into this new season of, of, of the holidays, going into the next year, and, and God gives you the ability to birth something. I think this side got it, and I'm ready to preach. But imagine, imagine that. But, but you know when someone is pregnant. Come on, now y'all got to help me out. And, and, and there's, there's ups and downs throughout the pregnancy, but then there's also those moments where you're like, wait a minute, we're actually having a baby. Right? You have to, you have to child-proof the house. Right? So you, you drive yourself crazy because you check everything multiple times because you're preparing for what God has given birth to. And, and when you have a child, you, you're checking sockets. Right? You're checking everything. You're rearranging furniture. You're preparing because God is allowing you to bring something into your home. God is doing something new in a particular season. And so some of you have, have transitioned your jobs. You've transitioned um, your employment. Some of you have started business and you've done certain things in your life, but it required what? Preparation. We prepare financially. Don't we? Lord have mercy. I'm not too convinced. That was, we're gonna try to, we prepare financially. Amen. Right? We, we prepare for things that we know are coming. And like a baby, when you're going to give birth to something, you prepare for a child. But how do you prepare when you're about to give birth to destiny? Let me see if I can help you. How do you prepare for what God has prepared for you? How, how, do, you, how do you, not me, how do you prepare for God's next move in your life. Now, Israel was preparing for God's next move. And as Israel prepared, if you read Joshua chapter 1, Joshua chapter 1, it, it opens. And, in, and, and when it opens, it says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Then he calls Joshua, he says to Joshua, prepare the people, stay with me, you're about to cross over. One person got it on this side and come back over here. See if 876 can help me preach over here. <laughs> Stay with me. The word of God says, listen, they're in a transition. And in this particular transition, God tells them, listen, I'm about to take you somewhere you've never been. And in order to do this, listen, he says to Moses, prepare the people because you're about to cross over. And when I read the book of Joshua, I learned that there are actually lessons for a crossover. And the word of God says, prepare the people because they're going to cross over. Now, a couple of lessons that we learned from this. The first thing I learned is, it's in Joshua chapter 3. It is that when you're going to cross over, you have to prepare yourself spiritually. Yes. Yes. Nobody wants to hear that. Yes. Yes. When, when you're about to cross over, when God is about to lead you and move you into the promise. For Israel, God was about to lead them into the promised land. And, but God would not let them go where he was taking them without preparation. Now some of us, now I got to look up. You want to go where God has ordained, but you don't want to do the work it takes to prepare where he's taking you. Some of you want it right now, but you've gone through no preparation to be ready for what God has for you when you actually cross over. You know, maybe the reason why you are right where you are is God's grace on your life. Because if you did cross over and you weren't prepared for what was on the other side of it, it would take you out. 
But God loves them so much. Listen, he, Joshua tells them in chapter 3, verse, verse 5, he says, prepare the people, listen, spiritually. How do I know that? Verse 5 in chapter 3 says this. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow, the Lord will do amazing things among you. Now, here's what he says. Listen, God is about to do some amazing things among you. But hold on, hold on. That's tomorrow. <laughs> Today, he says, consecrate yourself. See, some of us want to see the amazing things tomorrow, but we haven't prepared ourselves spiritually for what God is bringing tomorrow. And he says, consecrate yourself. It's interesting because the, the people of God, Israel, they would, they would go through various preparations in order to consecrate themselves. Now, if you read the, the Hebrew root word for that, it's where we get our word consecrate, where we get our word holy, where we get our word sacred from. And so when you read the original language, it expresses to us that this particular act that God is calling them to is an act of separation. In other words, whatever, whatever you've been accustomed to, whatever you've been holding on to, Whatever has been holding on to you. I need you to go into a season of consecration to separate yourself from anything that doesn't look like me. This is for the four people who, who, who want to live right. Praise God. But it's an act of separation. He says, consecrate yourself. Think about that for a moment. He's already promised that tomorrow God will do amazing things. But he says, in this very moment, I need you to consecrate yourself. Now, Israel would go through ceremonial washing. They would, they would, um, they, they would abstain themselves from certain relations. Y'all can interpret that yourself. I'm going to look up. Right? They, they, would, they, would, they would separate themselves from anything that would contaminate their relationship with God. They realized that in order for me to, to move where God has taken me, I can't play around with him anymore. If, if I'm going to go into the season that God has for me and God is going to lead me, listen, not into your promise. If God is going to lead you into his promise for your life, there is a difference. And God says, consecrate yourselves. Now, they, they would separate themselves from anything that would contaminate them or make them unclean. Now, some of you are chefs, some of you cook, and some of you burn the kitchen. That's okay. That's all right. But one, one, one of the dangers of food is if food gets contaminated. Are you with me? Now, how does food get contaminated? Well, food gets contaminated when microorganisms and, and parasites and toxins get inside of the food. All right? Now, if, if the food is not placed in an environment, at a particular temperature to preserve the food, if the food is just left out in the wrong environment, it becomes contaminated with, listen, microorganisms such as parasites and toxins. And when, when the food is contaminated, it's no longer any good and the contamination begins to destroy the entire pot. I, I, I apologize for asking you question, this question this morning, but what may, have, may you have done to place yourself in the wrong environment and that may be toxic and you may feel like there's parasites around you, well, it's because you left the environment you should have been in and you found yourself in an environment that you shouldn't be in in the first place. And the word of God says, listen, whatever will contaminate you, you got to separate yourself from that. And then listen, so I have a question for you. What things this year have you allowed to contaminate your relationship with God? What things this year have you and I allowed to contaminate our relationship with God? Because God says, listen, if you're going to cross over into this promise, you have to consecrate yourself. Now, if I had time, I'd ask you, what woman... If 
If I had time, I'd ask you, what man? If I had time, I'd ask you, what substance? But I, but I don't have time. But if I had time, I'd ask you, what website? If, if I had time, I don't have time. If I had time, I'd ask you, what fan page? But I don't have time. If I had time, I'd ask you, what are the things you're doing in the dark? But I don't have time. That are contaminating you from going and being where God wants you to be. He says, consecrate yourself. It means to separate yourself from anything that doesn't look like God. Yeah. See, this is a moment in Israel's history where they, they, couldn't, they couldn't fake it to make it. Y'all don't want to pray anymore. <laughs> they couldn't. See, see one, of the, one of the biggest lies in the church was just fake it to make it. Be, because you, you, when, you, when you learn how to fake it real good, you don't ever make it. Because you've been, been accustomed to a life of faking it, and you don't really make it. You can't fake it to make it. You have to faith it to make it. You've got to trust God that, Lord, I'm, I'm struggling, I'm weak, I have issues, I have temptations, but I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to guide me and to purify me and to give me everything that I need to look more and more like Jesus. And he tells the people to consecrate themselves. Are you with me? So consecration, one aspect of it is to restrict, right? They restricted themselves, but they also would separate themselves, but that's not it, right? Consecration was not just about separating yourself. Consecration was also about your loyalty. You, you wouldn't consecrate yourself if you didn't trust in and become loyal to the God you believed in. And so a part of consecration was their ability, listen, to show the world where their loyalty lied. Yeah. Now, if you saw Israel, their, their dietary laws, their restrictions, people knew where their loyalty lied based on how they lived their life. Yeah. Got one amen and then yes. <laughs> Think about this for a second. People knew where their loyalty lied based on how they lived their life. Yeah. Now, if a camera was to follow you all 2023, would the camera person conclude that your loyalty lies with God? It is, it is a declaration to the, to the world that my loyalty is with God. Where is your loyalty? Do, is, it, is it God or the culture? Is it God? Or the game? Is it God or the streets? Because you, you got to make a decision. Is it God or is it money? Because we have to make a decision where our loyalty lies. Now, there's nothing wrong with, 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 with having money. It's the love of money that causes problems. Because you can't serve two masters. See, if you serve money, you'll do whatever it takes to get money, and you've forgotten about God. But the word of God says to us, listen, where does your loyalty lie? You think about your life right now, where is your loyalty? Is your loyalty with the culture? Is it with the games you play? Is it with the streets? Where's your loyalty? To consecrate yourself means I'm making a declaration to the world, no matter what I go through, my loyalty is with God. Yeah. Listen to me, that means when you go in the office and people act crazy, and they will, and people try to challenge your integrity to get money, it means, nope, I'm good, my loyalty lies with God. There, there comes a moment in the life of every single believer where you have to make a decision where your loyalty lies. You're gonna have to make a decision with your friends, you know what, I gotta draw the line right here because my loyalty lies with Jesus Christ. You gotta make a, a, a decision with your family members, some of them, let me look up, and say, no, I love you, but my loyalty is with God. When you walk in your office, no, 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 I understand how you want to do business. I only do business the way God does business, and I'm not selling myself, losing myself, trying to make money in this building because my loyalty lies with God. Every believer has to come to the point where they decide, my loyalty is with God. When you're dating, 
Lord have mercy. I, I understand what you may want to do, but my loyalty lies with God. When you're with your friends and, 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 and uh, they're partying hard, that's all I'm gonna say. You gotta make a decision. I understand what you wanna do, but my loyalty, it lies with God. And, 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 and you gotta get to the point where you say, I don't care what it looks like. My loyalty is with God. As a businesswoman, I don't know who I'm talking to, or businessman, business owner, entrepreneur, listen to me. You're gonna be challenged financially where you're gonna to have to make certain choices. But will you make the decision that, that declares, I understand, but my loyalty lies with God. You, you may have to come home and have, a, have an uncomfortable conversation with your spouse and your children. But you know what? As for me and my house, I'm gonna serve the Lord. Because when you consecrate yourself, not only do you separate yourself, but you also make a public declaration that my loyalty lies with God. And so the crossover, the, uh, Joshua reminds us, first thing is I must prepare myself spiritually. Going into 2024, how are you preparing yourself spiritually for where God is leading you? Think about this. You think about your life, where God's taking you, the things he's revealed to you, the things he's shown you, the things you've dreamed about. What are you doing to prepare yourself spiritually for where God has taken you? Think about that for a moment. Where are you spiritually where God has taken you? In fact, are you spiritually equipped? For where God has taken you. I'm, let me help some of you out. This ain't got nothing to do with sermon, but I'm going to help somebody out. Sometimes we pray for things. We desire things. But you don't really know the weight of what that might do to you if you're not prepared spiritually. The title may look good, the position may look good, the money may look good, and all that'll take you out, you'll be de depressed, you'll have anxiety, maybe even suicidal, because what you thought it was ain't what it is because you weren't prepared spiritually. You have to be spiritually prepared where God has taken you. Here's the second thing. We must be spiritually prepared where God has taken us but we also have to follow the presence of God. You have to let the presence of God guide us. Y'all don't believe me. <laughs> Joshua told the people, listen to me, he tells the people to carry the Ark of the Covenant. The, the, the Ark of the Covenant becomes an intricate part of what God is about to do next in Israel's journey. So the first thing he tells them, this he tells them, gather the priest, tell the priest to carry the Ark of the Covenant. It's in verse 2, right? Verse 2, he says, after three days, the officers went throughout the camp. Verse 3, giving orders to the people, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and the Levitical priest carrying it, watch this, you are to move out of your position and follow it. Read that one more time. So he says, we've been here for three days. I want the Levitical priest to carry the Ark of the Covenant. Then he says, I promise I'm coming back to this. He says, when you see the priest go by with the Ark of the Covenant, it says, then you are to move out of your position and to get into position and then follow the Ark of the Covenant. Are you with me? But, he, but several times he mentions to them the significance and the role of the Ark of the Covenant. In fact, if you read, if you read the, the, the passage, it progressively reveals to us the impact of the Ark as you read it from verse 3, verse 8, and get to verse 13. You don't believe me? Let's read it right now. Verse 8 says this. Tell the priests 
who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you, here it is, when you reach the edge of the waters, go stand in the river. Are you with me? Verse 2 said this. Verse 2 said that the priest will carry it. Right? Verse 8 said that they will walk to the edge of the Jordan River and then they'll stand in it. Verse 13 says this. Verse 13 says, And as soon as the priests who are carrying the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, watch this, its waters flowing downstream will cut off and stand up in a heap. Are you with me? So at least three things are revealed to us in verse 2, verse 8, and verse 13. First thing is this. The Levitical priests are going to carry the Ark of the Covenant. Are you with me? The Levitical priests are going to carry the Ark of the Covenant. Second thing is that they're going to carry it and they're going to get to the edge of the Jordan River. And then they're told to step foot in the river. Then you get to verse 13. Verse 13 says to us, and listen, when they get in the water, as soon as the priest steps in the water, the water downstream will be cut off and the water will go into a heap. Watch this. Enabling, allowing the people then to cross over. But the people can't cross over. Somebody's preaching with me. Until the Levitical priests carry the ark. Then the, the Levitical priests must follow God's instructions and walk to the edge of the water. When the priest gets to the edge of the water, the priest has to have enough faith. Try not to preach. To put his foot in the water. And then when he does, the word of God says, the water will stop going downstream. It'll be cut off and go into a heap. But what is the significance of the Ark of the Covenant? Stay with me. Why the Ark of the Covenant? Well, for Israel, not only does it play a significant role in them crossing over, but the Ark of the Covenant literally symbolizes and signifies the very presence of God. The, the, the fact that, the, that they were not able to get out of their position is because they could not move out of their position until the presence of God was there. They were to remain where they were until the presence of God was where they were and the presence of God is where they're going. Now, you don't ever want to get out of position when the presence of God isn't there. You don't ever want to go forward into another season of your life when the presence of God hasn't gone ahead of you. And he says, listen, that the, 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 the Ark of the Covenant was the, was the very presence of God. Now, now if you open the, your Bible and never read it, that, that wasn't fair. I apologize. <laughs> you, you'll learn over time there are certain items that were inside of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, y'all know what they are? Y'all help me preach. Aaron's rod. Come on and help me preach. Somebody said the tablets. What else? The manna. Come on. Listen, y'all opened y'all Bibles. Praise God. So there are three, three major items. Three major items. You had the tablets, you had Aaron's rod that budded, and you had the golden pot that had manna in it, okay? Now, these items were, in, were significant and intricate to the life of Israel, but listen to me. When you see, when you see the impact of what these things meant, it, it would change the way that you read this passage. So, as, as in our Western culture, we read the Bible, there the ark went by. No, slow down. Slow down. You, you, you're reading it with our Western lenses, and the ark went by. If that's all you get out of that, we've missed it. Because if you were, if you were in those times, Israel, that's not an ark going by. That is the very presence of God that is going by. But why do we need it? Why? Here it is. Verse 4, verse four answers the question. Then you will know which way to go. 
Stay with me. Since you have never been this way before. Now raise your hand if you've been in 2024. Just, just waiting. Go ahead, just wait. No hands. Okay. Now, if, you, if you've been in 2024, we've got to have a conversation. <laughs> Whole prayer session right here after church. Right? But listen to me. He says the reason why you have to wait on the presence of God and follow the presence of God is because you're going into a season you've never been before. Now, listen, if you plan on going into 2024 or doing what you did before, this ain't for you. But if you plan on going into 2024 with an expectation that God is going to move you into a season that you have not seen yet, that your family hasn't seen yet, that your career hasn't seen yet, a legacy year for you that would change the trajectory of your entire family, you ought to help me praise God. Because God says, listen, when you're going into a new season, wait on my presence and I will lead you in a place where eyes have not seen Ears have not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man where God is about to lead you. Now, here's why I want to shout. Because if I'm Israel, and the word of God says that the Ark of the Covenant went by, listen to me. The Ark of the Covenant represented that when I, when I, when I stand in my position, and I'm about to move and follow it, I get out of position, and then I follow it, here's what it reveals to me. First of all, the Ark of the Covenant is the presence of God. So the ark isn't just walking past me. They're not just carrying a, a, an object in front of me. No, I am literally watching the presence of God with me and go ahead of me. But then it also had the tablets in it, right? Representing that if I'm in covenant relationship with him, then his promises just went ahead of me, trying not to preach. Now, if Aaron's rod is inside of it, Aaron's rod symbolized the favor that was on his life and his family's life. So I'm not just watching a rod buddy go before me. I am watching the favor of God go ahead of me. Not only am I watching the favor of God go ahead of me, but it says that manna was inside of there. Are you with me? Which means that the provision of God has gone ahead of me. So I'm not just watching the ark go ahead of me. I'm watching the presence of God go before me. I'm watching the mercy of God go before me. I'm watching the provision of God go for, before me. I'm watching the grace of God go before me. And if I act the fool, it was all covered with a mercy seat. So I'm watching the mercy of God go before me. And the word of God says, when you see my presence go by, and when you see my favor go by, and when you see my provision go by, and when you see my power go by, and when you see the presence of the Holy God go by, get out of your position and get in position and follow God into this next season because trouble can't stop you where God is taking you. God is about to do exceedingly, abundantly, above anything you can ask or think because the power of God has gone before you. And my prayer for you is when you walk into 2020, 24, you see the presence of God go before you. You see the grace of God go before you. You see the favor of God go before you. You see the provision of God go before you, and you have enough sense to get out of your position and get in position and follow the glory of God in the 2024. If there's about four people that need God's glory in this next season, you ought to help me give him praise. Because I've seen, I've seen trouble go past. I've seen hurt go past. I've seen drama go past. I've seen trauma go past. I've seen the schemes of the enemy go past. All that means nothing if the presence of God goes before me and the grace of God goes before me and the provision of God goes before me. I'll look at trouble and I'll declare trouble won't last always because the power of God has gone before me and I'm getting out of position in position because the glory of God is on its way. At least four people ought to help me praise God because better is on the way. I'm, I'm not done. I'm not done. We, we got till 10 p.m. I'm not done. I'm not done. Now, now watch this. Watch this. This was interesting. Now, now. Stay with me. Stay with me. It's going to get better. I, I promise you. I promise you it's going to get better. I promise you it's going to get better. So I'm, I'm, reading, I'm reading the text. 
And I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, something, something, something's up. Something's up. Now, in order for this to work, everybody had to be on one accord. Yes. Now y'all don't like me. Start the car. It's about, to, it's about to get rough. Now, in order for this to work, everybody had, first of all, the priest had to have enough sense to pick up the ark. Right? They had to pick up the ark of the covenant. They begin moving with the ark of the covenant. Now, if you read, if you read verse 13, I want, you, I, want you to, I want you to hear this. It says, as soon as the priest carrying the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, stepped foot in it, the water will rise. Now, go back to verse 2. Verse 2, it says uh, in the beginning, something like this to us. Right? That as when, when you go and, and, the, and the priest carries it, you are to stand 2,000 cubits away from the Ark of the Covenant. This messed me up. Because normally you would think that, you know, they're all traveling together. And as soon as the priest got to the water and put his foot in the water, the water started rising and they all just ran across the street. It's not what happened. Stay with me. This is why they had to be on one accord. Now, the, the, when the word of God says that they were about, about 2,000 cubic feet away from each other, that's a little more than half of a mile. I'm about to shout in a minute. Which means they had to allow the presence of God to leave where they were and to go where they were going. Then, watch this, while the priest was walking down there, they had to have enough faith to, tr to, 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 to walk and follow the priest from about half a mile's distance. Now watch this. They, they, they had then... I'm getting my steps in. I'm getting my steps in. Now the priest, watch this. The priest had to have enough faith to put their foot in the water carrying the ark. Stay with me. The word of God says that as soon as their foot went in it, the water would stop going downstream. Do you know you can die from the speed and the force of the water going downstream if you put your foot in it? You mess around with it long enough, you'll be... Under the water. Think about that for a second. Help! Right? Eating seaweeds and everything else. Think, think about that for a second. They had to have enough faith. Listen, and they, and they weren't empty-handed. They're carrying the ark, trying to balance the ark in their hands, while putting a foot in what is dangerous. But they had to have enough faith that because we have the presence of God, that the moment I put my foot in this water, the water's going to do exactly what God said it's going to do because God said when I put one foot in the water, the water don't have no choice but to obey the presence of the living God. I don't know what troubled waters you're going through, but I know that if you step in it with the presence of God, the water has no choice but to do exactly what God said it would do. Are you still with me now? Now, now, here, here, now I got to go back down here. Now watch, stay with me, watch this. Because Israel is a half a mile away. Which means, by the time, stay with me, by the time they put their foot in the water, the water has to cut off, then the water has to go up. Say it one more time. They're half a mile away. And while they're half a mile away, the water is going downstream. But when they put their foot in the water, the water first has to cut off, then it has to shoot up. And when that happens, they walk across on dry land. Which means, while Israel is down here, 
following God. They're taking their time following the presence of God. By the time they get there, they don't get to see troubled waters because by the time they get there, a mile and a half away, the water has already stopped. The water's already been cut off and the water's already gone up. And when they get there, the water is, has its hands up praising God because it ain't got no choice but to do what God's called it to do. I came to tell somebody you're on a journey going into 2024. And when you get there, the problem will already be removed and you'll be walking on dry land into the next season of your life because God's got your back and God's going to lead you and prepare you where you're going. At least four people ought to help me praise God. Because you thought there was going to be trouble on the other side, but God already moved the trouble out the way. You thought there was going to be drama on the side, but by the time you get there, drama has to move. By the time you get there, depression has to move. By the time you get there, anxiety has to move. By the time you get there, fear has to move. By the time you get there, worry has to go. By the time you get there, he has to go. By the time you get there, she has to go. By the time you get there, the glory of God will already be prepared. So all you got to do is walk through that bad boy in the mighty name of Jesus. At least four people ought to help me praise God because better is on the way. I apologize. You got till 8 p.m. You got till 10 p.m. First thing we learned is this. Consecrate yourself. I didn't say concentrate. I said consecrate. Consecrate yourself. You got to prepare spiritually. Why? Because there's no way in the world if I'm the priest, I'm putting my foot in that water. If I'm not spiritually prepared for what God's about to do. I, there has to be no speck of distrust when this big foot this big toe goes in that water. They had to prepare spiritually for what God was about to do. Here's the next thing. They had to follow the presence of God. Here's the last thing. Don't forget where you came from. Let's see if I can help you. Verse, verse 12, same, same book, Joshua chapter 3, verse 12 says this. Then now choose 12 men from the tribe of Israel, one from each tribe. You know what's interesting? In chapter 3, they never mention it again. It's, it's the weirdest part of the passage. It, it, it almost doesn't make sense. He explains everything. And then randomly, by coincidence, says... Hey, do me a favor. Just go ahead and pick 12 people, one from each tribe. As I was saying, now carry the Ark of the Covenant. It, it doesn't make sense. It almost doesn't fit. But if you keep reading, as they cross the Jordan River in chapter 4, verse 1, this is what he says. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men among you, the people, one from each tribe. Remember them 12 people I told you about? Yeah. This is why. And then tell them, take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan River. Watch this. From right, right where the priests are standing. And carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. Verse 4. So Joshua called the 12 men and had them appointed them as Israel, one from each tribe. Verse 5 says this. And he said to them, go over before the ark of the Lord, your God, into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder. This was no rock. They weren't skipping rocks. According to the number of the tribe of the Israelites, watch this right here, to serve as a sign among you in the future. When your children ask you, 
What do these stones mean? <laughs> Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of God, when it crossed the Jordan River, the waters were cut off. Let these stones be a memorial for you, for everyone for in Israel forever. The Word of God says, listen, Israel, consecrate yourself. Be prepared. Because God is about to lead you. Then the Word of God says, God is leading you to cross the Jordan River. Chapter 4, verse 1 of Joshua says, the whole nation crossed over. Not some of them. All of them. They crossed over. Then the word of God says, do me a favor. Go back in the middle <laughs> of the Jordan River where the water is cut off and the priests are standing. Take stones and take them back. And when your children ask you, what in the world does this stone mean? Yes. Yes. It is your job to tell them about the goodness and faithfulness of God. Now, I believe there are at least four people in here who already have some stones in their life. And God's word to us is, when he delivers you, when he blesses you, when he carries you, when he makes a way, when he sustains you, when he blesses you, when his favor is on you, when his grace is on you, when his protection surrounds you, it is our job not just to praise him for what he did, but to tell the next generation about how good God has been. Is there anybody in here with a testimony of all the things that God has brought you through? The word of God says it was a test turned into a testimony so that when your children and grandchildren ask you, how in the world did you make it? You have enough sense to tell them what God has done for you. Is there anybody in here with a testimony? Do your kids know how hard it was for you? Do your kids know the days you had Top Ramen? Do your kids know the days you can only eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? Do your kids know the day you only had a bus pass? Do your kids know when you were piled up in an apartment room and didn't know where to go? Do your kids know what you've really been through? Do your kids know the trauma and drama you've been through? The Word of God says there are stones to remind them that God pulled you through. Pastor JP, why do they need to know? Because your child's gonna go through something. And when your child goes through something, you got a stone to show them Baby, I know you're going through it right now, but let me tell you what God did for me. When cancer came, let me tell you what God did for me. When surgery came, let me tell you what God did for me. When divorce came, let me tell you how God pulled me out and how God dusted me off and started me on. My Is there anybody here with a testimony that God pulled you through? And the word of God says, when God pulls you through, you ought to tell your children about what you've been through because it declares the faithfulness of God.